from Berkeley about six or seven years ago in the Department of Statistics. So in the previous three lectures, you heard about some of the probabilistic models used in, uh, in evolutionary biology describing uh, what happens within a within species. And, and uh, Sebastian is going to tell us about some of the models that are actually used uh, to study evolution at a much longer time scale involving uh, different species, multiple species. Yes, OK. Thank you for. Um Inviting me, so yes, we're going to change time scales, and we're going to look at um, genetic variation across species and how you use that to reconstruct the evolutionary history um, of, of several uh, species, um, uh, and particularly the so-called um, uh, tree of life. So I, um, uh, my main goal is really just here to to give you a very high-level idea of what's sort of the basic phylogenetic reconstruction problem, how, what, what are the sort of basic classes of models that are used, and sort of the different types of, of methods that are used to solve, these, um, solve these, this inference problem. Um, if I have time, we'll see how, how it goes. I might say a little bit about some insights from uh, work that came out of the theoretical computer science community about these methods. Um, uh, but uh, overall, I'll sort of stay at a very um, high uh, level. If you'd like to have more details, let me, before I forget, just tell you right away. Uh, uh, two classic references. Um, Semple and Steele uh, phylogenetics um, goes into uh, maybe the more mathematical side of things. Uh, they cover especially a lot of the sort of combinatorial and, and algorithmic aspects of the phylogenetic reconstruction problem. Uh, it's a great reference. And then uh, Felsenstein um, has this also classic book about maybe the more statistical side of things, some of the more pragmatic things. Um, I, I'm going to stay on the sort of the theory side of thing. I won't tell you much about, if anything, about uh, um, implementations or particular software or, and so on. Um, but I'll. I'll uh, my perspective will be maybe a little bit in between. Um, if you want uh, more details about what I'm going to talk about, I have a whole series of lecture notes. Uh, just uh, uh, Google me. OK, so just to make sure everybody's on the same page, let me tell you what the tree of life is. Um, suppose that you have a bunch of, of, of related species. Say uh, these are uh, Darwin's uh, finches. It's a bunch of birds um, that live in the Galapagos island, sort of a islands. There's a sort of classic. Um, evolutionary biology example. Um, and the way that they are thought to have evolved, at least the Wikipedia level understanding of it, is suppose that uh, you know, there was maybe an ancestral uh, population that uh, originally maybe one, 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 one species that live on maybe this big island over here. And then at some point, maybe a group of birds migrated to a different island. Um, and they became reproductively isolated from the original uh, group uh, of, of birds. And they slowly sort of started evolving to a different envi environment. Maybe their beaks change over time because of a different food sources and so on. Um, and uh, eventually sort of formed their own species. Um, I won't uh, define what species is. Um, but then uh, maybe this process sort of repeated itself many, many times. Um, and you had uh, different species sort of evolving on different islands. Um, and that sort of led to the, the current diverse, diversity of these species. I mean, there's a different, different ones uh, that have sort of different morphological um, uh, characteristics. Um, one sort of neat way to represent graphically this, um, this history is, is with a tree, right? so um, a connected graph without, a, uh, without cycles. Um, this is taken from uh, Darwin's notebooks. Um, presumably, this big one here was the, is the root of the tree. That was the sort of ancestral population. And then every branching of the tree um, corresponds to a new species being created. So think about these birds sort of moving to a new island, they're sort of becoming reproductively isolated, forming their own species. And then they sort of evolve independently from the original uh, branch. And that repeats itself over and over. And you get this tree um, um, that gives you the sort of evolutionary history. Of the, of the species, the tips of the tree are either maybe extinct species or sort of contemporary um, existing uh, species. And so for example, A, B, C, and D here would be four different um, contemporary species of these uh, finches, for example. And our goal is to um, reconstruct uh, this tree and also possibly some information about what happened along these branches, maybe as some uh, parameters of the sort of mutation processes or um, uh, maybe some mutations that have occurred, and so on. But first, maybe before I explain how we do that, maybe I should say a little bit about why, 
why you should care about the tree of life. So this, this is a whole industry in biology of, of building these trees, and I'll say a little bit about how you do this in a second. But why, why do biologists care about this? Well, it's, uh, as I said, it's just a neat graphical representation of the history of life. It gives you a nice way to sort of classify species according to evolutionary um, principles. Um, but from a sort of data analysis perspective, um, it, it's this, it gives you this sort of very Im important structure that you have to take into account when you're analyzing data across different species. And maybe it's easier to understand on an example. Let me just go through this example here. This is called phylogenetic profiling. Suppose that you're, um, suppose that you're studying a new protein. Um, you don't know what it does. You don't know its function. You don't know sort of how it interacts with other proteins. Um, but you've observed the following thing. There's this other protein that's very well understood, say P1, um, that happens to have sort of a known function. Um, and you've noticed that you, know, you collected data from multiple species. I remember here the tips of the tree um, are these different species. And you've noticed that every time um, a species has a copy of the first protein, it also has a copy of the second protein. And when it doesn't have a copy of the first protein, it doesn't have a copy of the second protein. Um, and you might uh, use that as evidence that maybe these two proteins are somehow related to each other. Maybe they have a, a, a related function. Uh, they're in the same pathway or something like this. Um, but um, you know, how confident you should be in guessing that these two proteins are related really depends on the evolutionary history of, of, of these species. Uh, which one of these two? Um, give the strongest evidence that these two proteins are really related to each other. Uh, the, the, one, the one on the, on the right, B. Right? Because um, this one can easily be uh, explained by chance. Right? So if you think about maybe the uh, ancestral species here, add a copy of P1 and P2. And along this long branch, just by chance, P1 was lost and P2 was lost for just completely unrelated reasons. And then everybody down here just didn't, don't, doesn't have any of these two or, or has non-functional versions of these two. Um, whereas if you look on this side, um, in order to sort of try to explain what you're looking at here, um, if this you know, history is correct, it would seem that maybe the most likely scenario here is that maybe the, the original spe the ancestor had a copy of each one of them, but then it was lost multiple times in separate events, and each time when one was lost, the other one was lost. And so maybe um, uh, one, once one of these, uh, since their, their functions might be related, if one of them is not working anymore, then the other one has just no function anymore, and, and, and it just it gets eaten up by mutation, and eventually you sort of see this pattern. And so the claim is, if you take into account the evolutionary history, um, you get this much stronger evidence that there's a connection between these two proteins. Um, and in general, you know, uh, um, if you're studying sort of data across species, this is sort of something that you want to take into account. Okay, so we're going to assume that this is an, a sort of an important uh, thing to, 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 to reconstruct. And we're going to start looking at um, how, how biologists actually reconstruct the, the tree of life. Okay, so how do you reconstruct the tree of life? Um, so the, before uh, the advent of, of, of sequencing technologies, the way that you might uh, go about doing this would be by, you know, you're studying a bunch of species, and um, uh, often uh, certain groups of related species are going to be characterized by um, sort of common features, maybe morphological features or physiological features. Let's say you're studying a bunch of lizards, um, and there's a few of them that squirt blood at uh, their predators to sort of confuse them, and there's a bunch of them that don't. Right? So then maybe that blood squirting thing evolved once, um, and all of the sort of descendant of the ancestor who got that um, are, are part of this sort of subgroup. Um, and in general, you could find lots of different features like this that sort of characterize different subgroups of species. Um, if you go to the, uh, the Museum Natural, uh, of Natural History in New York, they have this really wonderful exhibit where you can sort of walk through the, the, the tree of life. And for each branch of the tree, they have these fossils that sort of show you the, the, the features that characterize the different groups that sort of emerge from this branch. And, and, um, and you can indeed sort of reconstruct large parts of the, of the tree of life using this kind of thing. But uh, the sort of the modern way of, of getting a much sort of finer uh, understanding of, of the evolutionary history of species um, is to look at um, DNA data. Okay, so the idea is I have a bunch of species here and I'm going to collect um, sequence DNA from all of them. And maybe I, I, I have, I've identified a, a, a gene that's sort of common to all of them and I'll get the sequence of, of this gene. And by comparing the gene sequences, I want to learn something about um, 
um, the evolutionary um, history of the tree of life. Um, the, the very high level idea, uh, Monty uh, this morning uh, um, explained that was, um, you know, the further apart two species are in the tree, the more sort of mutations have accumulated um, on, on, on sort of the, the path uh, from the, the original, uh, the most common um, ancestor, and therefore the more different the sequences is go are going to be. Um, and, and so that um, tells you something about the sort of relative positions of, of, of things in the tree. Um, the, the details of how you actually get this tree are actually interested and involve um, um, ideas from, from mathematics, statistics, and, and computer science. And so I want to give you just a little bit of flavor of, of, of how that's done. Okay, so our goal here is to uh, reconstruct a tree. Um, there's, there's other things that you might want to reconstruct along the edges, as I said, but let me just sort of focus on the tree itself. And we're actually going to be interested in a special kind of tree, uh, which is a tree with labeled leaves. Okay, so the leaves uh, here play um, a special role. Uh, this is where the data lives. This is where the contemporary uh, species are. And the labels of the leaves are going to correspond to the names uh, of the species uh, of corresponding to each one of these leaves. Okay, so I'm interested in reconstructing a leaf-labeled um, tree. It's not just the, the sort of structure of the tree that I want, it's the relative positions of the different species on the tree. Is, is, is dog closer to cat or is it closer to mouse and so on? Um, there's sort of different representation of this, uh, of this kind of uh, object that turns out to be um, interesting from a, a computational uh, uh, statistical inference point of view. Um, one is, is to think of, of a leaf label tree instead as a collection of bipartitions. Okay, so suppose that I look at, I have a particular tree here with the leaves uh, labeled. Um, I take any edge in the tree, say this particular edge. Well, that edge um, defines a bipartition of the leaves. There's the leaves on one side, and then there's the leaves on the other side. Okay, so for every edge in the tree, um, I define this bipartitions of the labels of the leaf. And so um, I get a collection of bipartitions. Now it turns out that um, I can go the other way around. If I give you all of the bipartitions, and they're all sort of correct, then um, you can easily sort of reconstruct um, reconstruct the tree. In the words, how do you do this? Suppose that I give you all these bipartitions. Well, one way to do this, you know, there might be several ways of doing this, might be to say, well, um, I, I'm going to see a bipartition that corresponds to these two guys on one side and everybody else on the other side. And so that I know that these two are sort of siblings at the first level. They're just, uh, it's called a cherry. Um, and so I could uh, identify this, this first bit of the tree and I merge them into a cluster of sort of super node. Um, and then I look at my bar partitions again, where I sort of removed one of them, and I represent every, um, the two of them by one of them. And, and then I just repeat. I find the next uh, cherry and so on. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to slowly build this tree, sort of one cherry at a time, one branching at a time, until I get the entire tree. Okay, so um, from a tree I can get the bar partitions, from the bar partitions I can get the tree. And that's a useful um, representation. Here's another representation. I can think of the tree as um, a notion of distance, a, a metric on the leaves. Um, and that's directly related to the, the high level um, idea that I just um, told you about. Right? Suppose that I, I take this tree here and I assign to every edge a positive weight. And so this, um, this, um, this weight could be, say, um, the time elapsed between these two um, these two uh, speciation events, or um, it could be the expected number of mutations in a gene along that branch of the tree. Um, and now, if I assign to every um, edge of the tree a positive weight, then I get a distance between every um, um, pairs of leaves, which is defined in the following. If I take two leaves, it's a tree, so there's a unique path between them, and I can sum the weights along that path, and I get uh, a number, which I'm going to call the distance between uh, in this case, C and D. I can do this for every pair. Um, and I get a notion of distance. It's actually a, a, a metric. Um, satisfies the, the, the triangle inequality and so on. It's, it's a special kind of metric called an additive metric in general. Um, satisfies this sort of a set of inequalities here at the bottom. Um, and again, it has this, this nice, neat property that um, it's invertible. If I give you an additive metric on a finite set, well, there's a unique tree instead of edge weights up, up to some, potentially some degeneracies um, that uh, 
um, outputs the same metric again. Okay, so if, I, if I'm given um, an additive metric, I can get back a tree, and that will be uh, one way of reconstructing trees in a second. Um, how do I do this? Again, let me just tell you at a very high level. Um, well, what you do is you compute this, this quantity here. Okay, so suppose that, I, um, suppose that I have only four, four species. Um, I'm ignoring the root here. You'll see in a second, it turns out that some of the statistical models that we're going to be using, um, the, the root is, is not identifiable. So I will often work, work directly with unrooted uh, trees. So there's this sort of no natural notion of time here. Um, um, if I have four uh, leaves, and I assume that I have these binary um, uh, internal nodes, every internal node, let's say degree, degree three, just to simplify, you can generalize this. Um, uh, then uh, there's really only three different topologies, leaf labeled topologies on these four leaves. And right? it's always the same tree structure, but uh, the relative position are different. Right? So A could be next to B, A could be next to C, or A could be next to D. So that gives me my three different leaf labeled topologies under these, these conditions. And now, suppose that I give you an, an additive metric on these four leaves, and, and you want to figure out which of these topologies am I looking at. Well, it turns out that you can figure this out by computing this quantity. So if I compute the distance between AC plus the distance between BD minus AB minus CD, um, I get something different on these three different topologies. So if I start over there, suppose that the true thing was um, AB on one side and CD on the other. Well, AC plus BD minus AB minus CD, um, what is going to happen here, because it's additive, of course, um, this edge is counted positively when I add it here, but it's counted negatively when I subtract over here, so it's going to cancel out. This one is going to cancel out. This one's going to cancel out. This one's going to cancel out. What I'm left with is twice the length of this middle edge. I'm going to get something positive. If the true topology instead was this one, or the one that generated this additive metric was this one, then I'm going to get exactly the opposite, right? So AC plus BD, and then minus AB minus CD. You do the, the cancellations again, and now you get minus twice the length of this middle edge. You get something negative, and you can convince yourself that if you do this over here, you get, uh, you're going to get zero. Okay, so if I give you an additive metric on, on four leaves, um, in principle, you can figure out which one of these topologies you're looking at. Now, in general, if you have more than four leaves, um, what do you do? Um, there's lots of different ways of doing this, but you could, for example, um, take every four tuple of, of leaves. For each one of them, you apply this test to figure out what the topology is to this restricted set of four leaves. Um, and then you get this sort of puzzle. And so these are overlapping. You know, they, they have leaves in common. Um, and now you just have to sort of put them together and get the entire tree. Now, in the case uh, where you get um, one a quartet, these are called quartet, one quartet tree for every uh, uh, four tuple, and they're all consistent with one tree, then there's a sort of an easy way of reconstructing um, the tree that it corresponds to. Um, that's sort of similar, for example, there's many ways probably, but the, 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 the previous um, slide where I, I was sort of finding one cherry at a time, you could do something very similar here um, and, and recover, your, um, recover your tree. So these are um, different representations of the output. What is the input? The input is um, a, set of, uh, a set of sequences, one for each of my species. Um, and uh, the information that I'm trying to, to get out of it is um, the, 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 the mutations that I've accumulated over time. Right? The Monty uh, this morning talked about this molecular clock assumption where um, in, each, in each branch of the tree, the sort of mutations are accumulating at a sort of roughly constant rate. And therefore, if you can sort of measure how much mutations have occurred uh, between two species, it tells you something about how far uh, past in the past they sort of diverged um, from their most common uh, recent ancestor. Most recent common ancestor. I guess uh, um, what I'll need is, um, to turn this into a, a statistical problem is a model of how uh, DNA evolves uh, on, a, on an evolutionary tree. Okay, so this is sort of maybe the simplest one uh, that is called the Juke Scanner model. Um, uh, okay, so I've got my tree. This is uh, the evolutionary tree that connects these, um, these five species. Again, the, the leaves are the contemporary species. You can think of this guy as the root and, and the branches. Um, and the internal nodes are sort of uh, ancestors. Um, at, sort of, at this level, um, we're going to um, ignore the, the, the population level variation. Okay, so we're going to assume that the, the, the differences between species are sort of much 
bigger than the, 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 the differences inside each one of these populations. So instead of, we're not going to model each one of these populations, instead we're just going to imagine taking one reference sequence from each one of them, um, and we're just going to track the evolution of that sequence on the tree. Okay, so I'm going to start at the root of the tree with a sequence. Okay, so I'm looking at a particular gene, say um, it has a, a sequence of ACGs and Ts. Um, that's the, my reference sequence from that ancestor, which I don't have access to, but right now all I'm doing is um, describing the model of evolution, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get back to the actual statistical problem of, of inferring uh, everything. Okay, so I'm going to imagine that the, the root adds some sequence, um, and then what happened over time is that mutations accumulated. Okay, um, and I to, to simplify the sort of standard uh, assumption is to assume that the sites are actually independent and identically distributed. So it's the same model for every site, but it's happening independently from site to site. Okay, so if I focus on one particular site, I ignore the other ones. The ancestor has a G over here. And I'm going to imagine that first of all, the, the tree here is deterministic. I'm not going to try to model how maybe evolution of these sequences has influenced the structure of the tree. I just have this tree that exists. And I'm just going to imagine that I have these sort of neutral mutations that I've accumulated along the tree. And now um, what's going to happen is that along each branch of the tree, there's going to be a certain probability that I have a, a change by the end of that branch. Okay, so I started with a G over here. There's a certain probability that I'm going to change by the time I get to A. And if I change, at least in this very simple juke counter model, I can have in uniformly any of the other uh, states. Uh, same thing over here, there's a probability of having a change. So in this case, there was no change. In this case, there was a change. I went from G to C. Okay, so each branch has a certain probability of flipping the parent independently of, of everything else. Um, I'm not flipping, I'm changing the parent. And if you change, you just jump from one to the, um, to the others uniformly at random. Okay, so you're going to do that starting from the root, moving away from the root all the way to the leaves. And eventually, you're going to get a state for each one of the, for each one of the leaves. And now if I imagine repeating that independently for each of the sites of the ancestor, what I end up with is a sequence for each of the, um, for each of the leaves. Right? So each, com uh, each contemporary species um, gets one um, copy sort of descended from, with modification from the, uh, from the ancestor. Does that make sense so far? Yes? Not make sense to have a trifurcation or a quadrifurcation for any tree. I'm seeing all the trees that you have constructed so far having only made up of bifurcations. Right. Why does it? Why have you not taken that? Look, no. Why does it not make sense to take that? I could no. So I could definitely generalize um, and imagine that there might be several speciation yeah. occurring at the same time. Um, I could represent this by saying that I have a very very short edge between the the, the apron in the in succession and this very, very short edge between them. So okay. it's sort of often, without much loss in generality, we, we assume that we have a sort of binary tree but where some of these edges might be maybe arbitrary uh, short. And so even though uh, what I'm going to talk about is always going to be binary in this way, you can generalize a lot of these things to, 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 to higher. Didn't your mammal tree before have the aardvarks coming out? They did. I, they, they, I think the, this guy had some uh, trifurcations, right? This one, right, for example. Oh, and even more. Look, there's a quad there. With the That's right. That's another one. So they really, so it's not, it's not just academic interest. These things are real. Um, I mean, I mean they, 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 it, there's lots of things where, on the level of resolution that we have from the data, that you might not be able to, to, to really to, to, uh, to see the, the yeah. tiny little uh, difference. Now, I, I said um, along each branch, there's a certain probability of changing. Uh, maybe a more uh, Maybe a more sort of accurate way of describing this is that um, along each one of these branches, I have a continuous time Markov process that jumps from state to state. So along, along this branch, even though I, I started at G and I ended up at G, in the middle, there might be some excursions to C, A, G, and eventually uh, you ended up at G. And so in general, I'm going to imagine that I have a certain rate matrix. This is not going to be really important. Um, if you don't like continuous time stochastic processes. But you have um, a rate matrix that tells you at what rate I jump from one state to another. Um, along each branch, I have a, a piece of information, which is how long do I run this process, right? So the time elapsed between these two uh, speciation event. Um, and I also imagine that I have a mutation rate. Now, Monty this morning talked about, right, so if you have 
um, a, a continuous time process like this, you can write the transition matrix corresponding to the jump from here to there as this um, exponential. Now, Monty this morning talked about the molecular clock assumption. He said that uh, there's a lot of evidence that um, the mutation rate, at least if you look at a particular protein, it might change from protein to protein, but if you look at a particular protein, it's often sort of tends to be rare, fairly constant um, across species. Um, in general, that's not um, quite true, especially if you look at larger sort of time scales, um, and there might be some differences maybe uh, in generation times that, that, that affect uh, the rate of mutations. And the sort of standard practice in, in, in phylogenetics is to assume that you have a mutation rate that might actually change from branch to branch. Okay, so I'm going to have this mu e here, which is the rate at which these mutations are occurring uh, for a particular site. Now, of course, um, in general, I could have also a more general matrix Q here. I'm assuming that the jump from A to all of the other ones is always sort of symmetric. Um, but um, you could go beyond the Duke scanner model and have a sort of more um, general transition matrix, or rate matrix that where certain transition might be more likely than others. Um, I thought you can take all of that um, into account. Now, what I have not done here in this model is to, to take into account uh, some other things that happen that are important. Uh, one of them is this idea of insertions and deletions. Right? right now, what I'm assuming is that the only thing that happens is that at a certain rain rate, you have substitution. A G becomes an A or a C becomes a T. There's other things that happen. So insertions and deletions might happen where it create uh, new sites or some site might disappear, um, or, or, or a bunch of, of, of sites at the same time might disappear. Um, that's sort of taken into account. Uh, I'll come back to that maybe at the end if I have time. Uh, it's, uh, biologists take that into account by doing this first pre-processing phase where they are uh, aligning the sequences and try to guess where these insertions and deletions have occurred um, by filling with gaps and sort of trying to figure out which side corresponds to which. Um, I'll come back to that at the end. But we'll assume that this was done and that we have a, a data set that's sort of been clean of insertions and deletions. Another interesting thing is to look at um, different sites might evolve at different speeds. If, for example, because of the genetic code, every third position is sort of very redundant and is less sort of influenced by um, uh, potentially selection, and therefore there might be more changes there um, than in other places. And so to take that into account, biologists will allow um, a rate uh, of evolution that actually changes from site to site. So you would have another thing here that's random that uh, depends on the actual position in your gene. But I'll, I'll ignore that uh, and come back to that at the end. Any questions about this model before I move on to the actual statistical problem? So if you, if you, if you include some maybe a more general rate matrix and these uh, rates across sites, including maybe some sites that never change and others that change at sort of a random uh, rate, um, you get a, a sort of a, a very standard uh, model that's used um, uh, in biology to model how uh, DNA uh, changes across an evolutionary tree. Oh, maybe I should mention also there's some interesting connections to statistical physics. This basic model is sort of related to the so-called Putz model with a free boundary. And, and in the theoretical computer science community in particular, there's been some interesting uh, work about uh, how to exploit these connections and, and the knowledge about this kind of model. Uh, but I don't think I'll be able to talk about that. Okay, so what is the, uh, the actual statistical problem now? Um, I'm, I'm imagining now that I don't actually know the tree. All I know is I have a certain number of species, um, and I'm getting uh, a sequence for each one of them that I've been already aligned. So I can think of them as IID samples. Right? So these sequences are like IID samples from uh, a juke scanner model or a more general Markov model on a tree. And my goal is to go from these sequences, these samples, to, um, to the actual tree that generated the, the data. Okay, so the, the leaf, leaf label tree and potentially you know, information about Q and the mutation rates and the times, or at least the product of mutation rates and times along all of these branches. That's my basic problem. Okay, so the input is I have a bunch of sequences. So SA1 is the sequence at species A. Um, this is a bad notation. Species A might be this guy here. Uh, the first position, so it would be this one. And then uh, I have K, a length K gene, I can imagine. Um, and so I have K sites here, or K samples, um, for each one of my species. And now my goal is to find a map that uh, starts from these sequences. Right? So for each species, I'm denoted the, the species by L here, um, I have for each species a sequence of length K. Um, and I want to map that to the space of trees, which I denote by Tn. 
um, and I want to output a tree. That's a, a well-defined statistical problem. Well, let's see that it's well-defined. There's, um, right, so there's, there's a whole industry of, of, of coming up with methods for solving this basic problem. Um, and if you're interested in, in sort of analyzing theoretically how good these methods are and sort of understand better their, their behavior, there might be sort of two basic criteria that you're interested in. One is, well, how efficient are they computationally speaking? Right? So if I'm nowadays biologists might be constructing trees on tens of thousands of species, and the number of trees uh, that have 10,000 leaves is you know, astronomical. And so you cannot just look at each one of them and see which one fits your data best. You have to come up with um, a, a computationally efficient way of, of, of fitting the data to your, to your model. Um, the other uh, side, of course, is how accurate is this reconstruction? Um, first of all, is this problem even well defined? Right? There's this question of identifiability. Um, if I, um, um, is it the case that, right, so imagine that I uh, give you uh, infinitely long sequences here. Basically, I tell you what the distribution is of each one of these sites. Um, is it the case that there's only one tree and one set of uh, parameters that outputs that particular distribution? Um, and for the particular model, at least, that I, that I showed you uh, in the previous slide, um, you can actually show that indeed um, um, each, each tree and, and, and branch length gives rise to a different distribution. And, and therefore, in principle, if you have infinitely long sequences, um, you should be able to, uh, to get back the model. Things change if you look at um, rates across site, for example, but I'll come back to that at the end if I have time. Um, okay, so the problem is, um, in principle, well defined. Um, uh, and so one sort of natural thing that biologists have been looking at is, is my algorithm consistent? What does consistency mean? It means that as, as the sequence length goes to infinity, and of course the real sequences are, are, are finite, but if I imagine that I generate infinitely many samples from this, um, from this process, is my algorithm, uh, my reconstruction algorithm, guaranteed to recover the correct tree uh, with probability one in the limit? This is called statistical consistency, and it's sort of a basic requirement uh, uh, when you're sort of designing methods for reconstructing. Yes? So, so I mean, there's also a modeling question. Is this thing based on a model which is close enough to the truth to be relevant? That's so that. One way of asking this is uh, is the performance of these algorithms on real data comparable to the, the performance of these algorithms on simulated data? That's a great question. Right? So it, it's, it's, um, it's really not obvious to. to, to, to to say anything about real data because we don't know the truth. And so it, it might be difficult to actually know what the real tree is. You might have other information, maybe fossil data, or geography, or, or other things that, um, uh, that biologists might use where if you showed them a tree, they might say this is definitely wrong. But in general, we, we sort of don't know what the truth is, and therefore it's sort of hard to, um, to, to assess the performance of algorithms or even uh, how, how good models are um, by looking at, sort of at real data. So in practice, what biologists or, or computer scientists who work on this kind of thing do is they, they do simulations, of course, and there you know the truth, and you can see at least under sort of very potentially unrealistic conditions how your algorithms do. But it, it's a sort of a, a non-trivial problem to go beyond that. Okay, that's a good uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, there there might be some things that you can do, but it's it's, it's an untrivial question. Or you could do like half the genomes and half the genomes separately, like bootstrap. And that's I don't know, yeah. you, you, that's just showing that the thing is consistent with itself. It's right. Like, so it's it's no. Really. That's right. That's right. Yes. So these are good questions. So here I'm going to assume that these models make sense and uh, well, that they tell you something about. Now, as far as I know, biologists have been using them uh, and, and have been generally sort of happy with what they're reconstructing. As far as I know, so they must have some bearings to reality. Okay, so what are sort of standard uh, methods for reconstructing trees? Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. As I said, this is basically a zoo of methods. Um, but these are sort of uh, three standard sort of categories of, of methods. The first one I've already hinted at, which is um, this uh, notion of a distance matrix method. Okay, so I said, if I, if I imagine that on my tree I put uh, weights that correspond to the expected number of mutations, say, 
uh, on that branch, um, um, I can define this notion of metric, which is you know the, the total expected number of mutations between two leaves, um, and uh, and from there I can actually get a tree uniquely and, and efficiently. Uh, it's, it's sort of uh, easy to, to build a tree from the, the true additive metric. How do I get this from the data? Right. And so it turns out that if you um, this lambda o e here, maybe I should say what that is. Lambda e here is my my branch length u e. TE, right? remember this is a mutation rate, TE is the, the length of the branch in time. Um, if I imagine, again, putting these weights on my uh, branches, um, it turns out that um, under the Juke scanner model, and there's more general formulas if you have a more general model, um, uh, it turns out that the sum of the weights on a path between two leaves can be rewritten in terms of the model as this expression. Okay, so it's a log of something, and that something is um, the probability that if I look at say the first position in species A and the first position in species B, what is the probability that they disagree? That there's something different there. Okay? There's, a, there's a log here. Um, somehow what happens is that you know, since you only see the endpoint, there you might, as I said before, there might be a sort of whole um, trajectory between them where you, you keep jumping from one thing to another. You're only seeing the endpoint. And so the logs and to not take into account these sort of hidden mutations. Um, but at the end of the day, you can relate this notion of distance to something that you can actually see in the data. Right? So now what, I, what do I do to estimate this P? I, I take my two sequences and I just count how often they disagree. Right, so the, fre the frequency of disagreement will give me an estimate of that. If I plug that into that formula, it gives me an estimate d hat um, a b of my uh, distance matrix. Well, this is the distance matrix. Yes, okay, so I can think of it as a matrix if I look at every pair. Um, these are my leaves. And for every pair of leaves, I have this um, estimate of the distance between them, which I call the distance matrix. Um, and methods that start from there to build a tree are called distance matrix methods. Um, um, and so, for example, if I just uh, apply the, the basic idea that I had before, um, which was this idea that you reconstruct quartet trees and then you put them together, um, um, that gives me one way uh, of reconstructing the tree. Here's another uh, way. So there's lots of different ways of doing this. I suppose that I have a molecular clog this time, um, and so the mutation rate is the same everywhere. And so what that means is mu e is equal to some fixed mu um, for every e. This is called the molecular clock assumption. Um, then uh, I actually have a rooted tree now. I can actually identify the root. Everything is at the same distance from the root, so there's a sort of special node, which is the root. Um, and if I, uh, I assume that my data was generated on a tree, I, under a tree like this, um, I can uh, easily reconstruct the tree by doing uh, an uh, hierarchical clustering kind of scheme. Right? So I can look at the distance between every pair, and the two closest ones are going to be this cherry over here. So the two closest ones are a cherry in the tree, and so I can uh, group them together by just identifying which ones are the two closest. And then um, I think of them now as a super node. I remove the corresponding uh, uh, row and column say, for five, um, and now I have four, this sort of super node. And then I just start over. I look at the two closest ones. Well, this time it's going to be one and two. I, I put those together. And then um, now I have three super nodes, uh, two super nodes in this original three, and then I look at the two closest again, it's going to be this one, two, with three, and I do this again until I only have one super node left, and if you sort of unroll this process, what you get is the sequence of clusters that corresponds to the, the, the tree. Okay, so um, a very basic method here would just be to uh, this um, clustering approach. Um, now, this will work perfectly if I have exact, if d hat is exactly equal to d, um, in reality, of course, depending on how much data I have or whether the, the model is right, you know, I might, I'm going to get an estimate of, of d hat, uh, of d, right? And so this process might fail at some point. I might get the wrong uh, clustering. Um, and in order for this to work, well, basically, it has to be the case that the sort of the errors that you're making are maybe smaller than maybe the smallest branch of the tree. If that's, if that's correct, if that's, the, if that's true, um, this procedure basically is going to work. Um, there's lots of other ways of doing this. Uh, typically, uh, you'll get sort of polynomial time algorithms. They're uh, statistically consistent because, uh, uh, just by the law of large numbers, the estimate for this 
as k goes to infinity, as my sequence length goes to infinity, it's just going to converge to that quantity. And once I have the correct quantity, if I use an algorithm that at least works on, on the real thing, on the real additive metric, then um, in the limit, uh, once I have enough precision here, I'm going to be guaranteed to get the correct uh, tree with hyperability. Um, not all of these methods are polynomial time. So for example, in the, the theoretical computer science community, there's people that have looked at sort of metric fitting um, methods where you, um, right, so you have this d hat. You might want to look for, it's a matrix, you might want to look for an additive metric that is closest possible to d hat in some measure. Maybe the L infinity difference between them is the, the smallest, the largest difference between two entries. Um, and, uh, Except in some special cases, you often get sort of NP-hard problems in that case, but there's some approximation algorithm. Um, so it's, that's yes. also, I guess it's not a convex optimization thing, because your constraints aren't such that it's convex, so it's sort of nasty numerically, right? Yes, I think so. Now, there's another class of optimization methods that, instead of working with this distance matrix, work directly with, um, with the sequence data. Right? And so one thing that you might want to do is, for example, this the parsimony um, method, which is maybe one of the oldest ones, um, is, is doing the following thing. Suppose I give you this data set, and I give you a particular tree. Um, for that tree, you can compute the parsimony score, which corresponds to the following thing. You're going to assign a sequence to every internal vertex in such a way that you minimize the number of mutations along the edges. This is called the parsimony score. And then you take the tree that minimizes that. Okay, so you're doing this optimization problem over the space of trees where you have a particular score that corresponds to choosing internal sequences that minimize the amount of, of mutation that you need to explain the data. <laughs> now that might, that might make sense for, um, you know, that probably made more sense for, you know, it, it makes sense when, when the, the mutation rates are sort of low or if you're looking at, you know, what I, what I, what I talked about, you know, the, the blood squirting thing where the things are, that might be very rare, these, it's a new feature that arises. Um, and you might uh, want to use maximum parsimony there just to, um, to put those together into a tree. But in general, since it's not sort of model-based, um, it gives you methods that are, that are not consistent. So you're not guaranteed that you're going to correct tree. Actually, it's an old result of Felsenstein that, that um, you can, you can you know, there's actual trees where uh, you can show that you, as the sequence goes to infinity, you're just getting out the wrong tree out of it. Um, yes? Very, very good. I'll, 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 I'll come back to that if I have time. Um, um, now, uh, the, um, the, uh, from the computational side, of course, the parsimony is an NP-hard problem. You can think of it as a, um, it's like a Steiner tree problem on the Boolean hypercube. Right? So if you, um, instead of ACGT, suppose that you should have zero, one sequences, and each data point it's just each sequence is just one point in this Boolean hypercube, and so these are your Steiner nodes. You're trying to connect them with a tree, and and each edge corresponds to exactly one mutation. So you put a weight of one, um, and finding the Steiner tree there, um, it gives you the maximum parsimony tree. And this is NP-hard. It's hard to approximate. And so in practice, what biologists would do is is some kind of local optimization heuristic, you know. Uh, they would, and you have to realize that now you're, you're optimized over, over the space of trees, this sort of complicated um, uh, uh, opt objective function, which is not uh, convex or anything. And so you, um, you know, one thing that you might do, you start from some tree, and then you uh, change it by doing one of these tree changing operations, for example. Uh, one of the better, ones, better known ones would be subtree prune and regraph, where imagine this is a tree, so each one of these blobs is a subtree, um, and I yank, uh, I prune, one of the subtrees, and I just move it somewhere else. I get a new tree on it. Okay, so I could move through, uh, through a tree space in this way, um, and every time you know, I could look at which one of my neighbors has uh, the highest parsimony score and move over there and so on. And maybe sometimes you make you know, uh, bigger moves or you start from different places to try to sort of get out of uh, local optimum and so on. Um, and, and so biologists have developed sort of heuristics that uh, seem to work uh, fairly well. But in general, it's sort of a it's an NPR problem. So you don't really know what you're getting out of, getting out of this. 
Okay, so this is uh, NPR and not consistent. Um, if you want to turn this into a, a consistent method, you can change the objective. And the natural thing to do here is, since you're you know, interested in the properties of this model, this, this algorithm under a model, well, uh, it's sort of the natural statistical way to deal with that is to look at the maximum likelihood instead. Right, so what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to search over the space of all trees and branch lengths now uh, and maximize the probability of observing the data. Okay, so for every tree and every uh, branch length, I can compute the, the probability of observing the data under this particular model. Uh, each site is independent, so I get a product, and then each one of these things can be computed uh, by dynamic programming. Same, same was true over here. If I give you a tree, there's a, a simple way of computing the parsimony score uh, by dynamic programming. So you can do the same thing for maximum likelihood. And so if you, if you look for the, the tree and the branch length that maximize this, um, you get the maximum likelihood tree. Um, and that um, has been shown to be... Um, has been shown to be consistent, and it's sort of a generic kind of property. Okay, so as a sequence length goes to infinity, this, um, this guy approximates the likelihood better and better, and for the likelihood, it just follows some you know, convexity or something that you, um, you get the right. The, the, the true tree maximizes this thing. Um, now, it's also, unfortunately, NP-hard, uh, hard to approximate. It sort of follows from on the fact that par maximum parsimony itself is NP-hard, if you just, um, um, it turns out that you have very low uh, mutation rates. The, 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 the likelihood, if you sort of expand in the branch length, the first term is the parsimony score. And you can sort of connect them uh, computationally in this way and show that uh, you get an NP-hard problem there. Too. Okay, so once again, what biologists do in practice is they have these heuristics that are actually uh, supposedly very good, uh, where they do sort of local optimization and, and, and find uh, the best possible tree um, in that space. Um, there's a related class of method that I'm not going to talk about, which are uh, Bayesian methods, where now you have a prior um, and you uh, sample from the posterior by doing a sort of Markov chain on the space of trees and branch length. Um, and this is also um, is sort of computationally very heavy, uh, but it gives uh, biologists really like those methods. It gives a lot of information about it. Um, about the data. What's, what's the big advantage of maximum likelihood over distance metrics? Ah, so, so in practice, biologists actually prefer this one, at least those who know what they're doing, um, use maximum likelihood. And uh, even though it's, it's, it's slower, right? So you can get a tree much faster if you use, say, neighbor joining, which would be a standard approach. That's distance matrix. Um, um, but there's a sort of large, there's, you know, there's, there's a body of evidence that, that suggests that maximum likelihood is just more accurate. It just it works better. You get better trees. Of course, for biologists, you know, it, it might take a long time to collect the data, and so even if they have to run the algorithm for a month or two, it might not be so uh, important. And so they, they might not care that much about the computational efficiency as long as they can run uh, can run the thing. Um, but um, they they seem to be getting better answers out of this than uh, than out of this one. Okay, so a natural question that's coming back to your question here is. Well, statistical consensus, these, both of these types of methods are so sort of statistically consistent. Can we say anything, theoretically speaking, about why this one might be better than a lot of methods of this type? Um, and, and for that, you want to do exactly what you were suggesting, which is to look at, uh, at least that's what uh, people have done um, in, in recent work, is to look at the rate of convergence. So I know that if I have infinite amount of data, eventually I converge to the right, uh, to the right thing. But, um, how fast do I converge, right? So if one method requires less data than another, then somehow it's sort of better at extracting information. Um, and you can show that um, it's, it's, still, it's still not very well understood, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Yes? So um, on the how complicated these trees are? How complicated the trees are? They could be any kind of tree. Suppose, uh, hypothetically, I'm sending an agent before to the actual tree, and I'm extracting, let's say, one bit of information. I'm leaking from this process, uh, let's say, one bit of information, not like two or three. Can this somehow, according to your re reaction, I think that this can tell me nothing um, about speeding up or improving the accuracy of these methods? Right. I'm not sure what you mean. So if I know something about the structure of the tree, maybe, yeah, is that what you mean? Does yeah. that make the problem easier? It's a thought experiment. So just, 
uh, maybe I'm not expressing it very well, but you're, you're sending an agent, a function, that can actually look at the actual tree and click something like very, some very little right. out. Uh, so if these trees are very complex, then I'm going to learn nothing, basically, according to what you said. All right, so I mean, I, I, if, if I understand what you mean correctly, um, there are some results that, that say that um, maybe not so much from a computational pro point of view, but from an accuracy point of view, how much data you need to actually get a good reconstruction. Um, there's certain classes of trees that are easier than others, and, and I might get to that. But that would be one way in which you can sort of use the structure to, to get uh, a sort of better answer in a sense. Let me, let, let me maybe I'll get to that and I'll, you can ask again. Um, okay. <coughs> Any questions? Yes. So, so uh, all these methods are based on computing the distance. So you start out with a bunch of strings, and the first thing you do is throw out all the information except the having distance between them. No, so only the first class is of this type. These two actually need the full, the full data. You cannot reduce them to computing Hamming distances. Okay. Right, so these really take into account the sort of higher order patterns in the data across species. Okay, so, so that was going to be my question. There's a clear difference between <coughs> distances for a silk Yes. And so there has been work um, about whether that transformation uh, loses information so much that you get sort of different accuracy. Um, and it turns out to be uh, surprisingly that um, you can get more out of these Hamming distances than you might think. Um, but I don't think I'll be able to get to that. I'm happy to tell you that offline. But there are also things that interpolate between them, right? Things that just, instead of just using pairwise comparison, use, you know, sort of three and four lines yes. that don't go to the full yes. maximum yes. likelihood thing as well. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's other methods that I'm really sort of not uh, getting into yeah. here. These are sort of the main ones. Um, there's some things that I swept under the rug, and let me just mention them quickly. I actually already mentioned them, uh, but just uh, to make it clear. Right, as I said, uh, in reality, um, if you look at, you know, if you ignore the sort of very high level uh, rearrangements, um, that's in an interesting problem in itself to figure out where the, the proteins uh, end up, uh, whether there's sort of c common proteins in between different species. Um, there's the, the issue of, uh, at, the, at the sort of more local level, there's these insertions and deletions that are occurring. And the way that biologists deal with this is by doing this pre-processing where they sort of put gaps in there and try to, um, um, uh, to uh, fit the sequences as much as possible before running one of those sort of standard uh, reconstruction algorithm. And um, it's certainly a, a question as to whether this step actually messes up the next one. And there's been some very interesting uh, experimental work in particular in, in recent years uh, uh, looking at this question um, and, and taking the, the, this thing further by, by maybe trying to model the entire process, you know, mutations and uh, substitutions and insertions and deletions and trying to get both better alignments and better trees at the same time. You get this very difficult uh, computational problem. Um, so that's been one active area of research where there's been lots of interesting things. Um, and there's few results. There's a few. Costas and I worked a little bit on this question from a theoretical point of view of trying to recovering some of the um, standard results uh, about uh, these methods from a theoretical point of view um, in the case where you also allow insertions and deletions. I won't uh, get into that. Um, uh, there was a question. Yes. You could, yeah, you you could you could try to model gaps as some extra state, uh, or or you could just treat it as some missing data. Right? You could maybe just uh, keep only those columns that don't have gaps or something. Uh, you know, there's probably lots of different ways that biologists deal with those. But the idea would be that you know, if I put a gap here, is because maybe um, that the the site that corresponding to G in the ancestor actually was deleted in these two species, and so I don't see it anymore. And so I guess. Just by trying to align everything, that there, there, there might be something missing over here. That's sort of what multiple sequence alignment. So, is there a debate on whether it's more feasible to construct trees post or pre alignment? Or I mean, there's no de debate that it's, it's <coughs> much harder if you do it at the same time, and you get this much more, this very difficult problem. Um, and I think there's experimental evidence that you get better trees and better alignments if you try to do both at the same time, but it's a challenging problem. Um, 
the other thing I mentioned uh, was the idea that different sites might evolve at different uh, rates. Um, and so some, some sites might be slower than others. So you can think of a sort of rescaling of the entire tree. Um, and that leads to something called uh, mixture models. Um, and there's lots of questions there, and particularly there's the identifiability question. And there's all these negative results. Uh, Steve, in particular, has a result like this where you can show that two different models um, actually lead to the same distribution of data, and therefore you cannot distinguish between them. And so that becomes an issue when you deal with, um, uh, with right rates across sites or, or in general, sort of mixtures of trees. Um, so there's lots of interesting results there, not so much uh, algorithmic results. So let me skip that. Um, since I have maybe 20 minutes, let me tell you a little bit about, unless there's questions. Um, this, this, this question of, of, of rate of convergence in the, in the samples. Okay, so um, we, we said that we have different methods that are statistically consistent. It's right, so maximum likelihood is statistically consistent. Uh, a lot of distance metrics <coughs> methods are going to be statistically consistent. That is, if I, if I give you an, enough data, eventually the methods, at least from a theoretical point of view, are guaranteed to sort of converge to the right thing. Um, but um, some methods are, are just more accurate than others, and, and, and the statistical consistency by itself really doesn't tell you anything about which ones are, are better than others. And so, in general, what you'd like to be able to say is, you know, you run a method on a particular data set. Um, it outputs some tree. It might not be exactly the right thing, but it might be at some distance, say, in the subtree prune regraph uh, distance. And you'd like to know something about, you know, how far you're going to be from the truth. And that's going to depend in sort of in a complicated way on, on all the parameters of the model. Um, and it seems to be a sort of different, diff difficult thing to, to characterize. Um, instead, the sort of uh, their approach that has um, arose in the theoretical computer science community is to look at a sort of proxy, which is this rate of, of um, of convergence. Okay, so before I get to that, let me just uh, explain the picture. Okay, so in this part, I'm going to think of my DNA sequences as pictures. Okay, so each each point, each pixel is one site in my DNA. Instead of ACGT, I've got black and white. Okay, so and I'm going to visualize what happens to my DNA over time by just thinking of it as you know random noise accumulating in my in my picture. And so if I do this on a tree. Um, uh, what do I get? I, I get something like this. Okay, so this is an actual simulation. I started at the root with a particular picture, um, uh, a particular uh, DNA sequence, and then along each one of these branches, you know, the uh, the mutations accumulated, and I get this, this sort of a noisy version here, and so on. The the the, the simulation is maybe not that. Um, this is a joint simulation with Costas. Um, the in that quite. The, the one problem with it is, is, is that these two guys look the same. Uh, they really only, only have the same low noise level compared to the original picture, but the mutations are actually in, in different uh, positions. Okay, so these are independent noisy channels. And so you repeat that over and over. And so what you, uh, what you get to see is this is your data in the red box, and you're trying to reconstruct um, the tree. And so you can think of this as a broadcasting process on this noisy tree channel. You start at the root with a particular image, and you get this sort of distorted uh, picture at the, at the, at the, at the leaves. Um, and um, sort of a lot of insight uh, from this line of work come from uh, the idea that um, you know, you're, you're learning this, this graphical model, this Markov model on a tree, and one key feature of it is that you have all of these hidden nodes, of course, right? there's all these uh, sequences that I'm, I'm not actually seeing. But uh, furthermore, some of these sequences are actually quite far from where the data lives. Um, and understanding how well sort of information propagates down this tree is something that uh, leads to uh, sort of interesting insights about what makes a good method, what makes a bad method, and how you can sort of uh, design new approaches to reconstruct the tree, uh, in, at least in a sort of more statistically efficient way. I guess I'm going to, to formalize um, some of these results, I'm going to introduce uh, what I'm going to call the sample complexity, which right? is just the rate of convergence in the sequence, in the sequence length. Right? So I, I, I'm looking at a particular method that's statistically consistent. So as k goes to infinity, the sequence length goes to infinity. Um, I'm guaranteed to recover the, the true tree. Now, what I'm going to be interested in is, well, how, how, this, how fast do I get there? OK, so I'm going to say that I reconstruct with a, a sam sample complexity of k um, if the probability of reconstructing the correct tree with sequences of length k is at least 1 minus delta. And what I'm interested in is how does k depend on 
the model, in particular, how does it scale with uh, sort of different structural uh, parameters of my model? Right? So uh, it will turn out that the more leaves I have, the more data I'm going to end up needing. Um, the shorter the branch lengths are, right, or, or the shorter the shortest branch length are, is the, the, the more data I'm going to need. Right? So I, I've already mentioned this parameter when we talked about um, distance matrix methods. Right? For them to work, it's sort of clear that if there's a very short branch, it's going to make things difficult. Um, um, and then the depth of the tree is also going to come in. Uh, I'll define more formally in a second. Okay, so our goal is, you know, this is, may not be exactly what biologists would like to know about a particular method, but it's a good way to sort of try to quantify how well different methods um, extract data information from the data by saying, well, uh, if, if a method requires less data than another one, then maybe it's just it, it's going to give you more accurate answers. I guess it's sort of a proxy that, that, that we can prove a lot of things about, and it turns out to give some interesting uh, insights. Okay, so what, um, what can we prove about this? Um, so the, the first class of methods that was very uh, heavily studied there um, was these distance matrix methods that are just sort of easier to, um, to understand. And so suppose that I go back to this idea of thinking about the distance between two leaves in the juice canter model as an expression that I can actually estimate from the data by looking at the, at the hemming distance between uh, sequences. Now, if I want to know how well a particular method is going to work, well, I need to know how accurate my distance is, uh, estimate is going to be. And that's going to depend on how much data I have. Okay, so the more data I have, the, the, the closer p hat is going to be to the true, uh, the true additive metric. And the smaller the, the, the error is going to be, the, the more accurate the methods are going to be. And so um, p hat here is really just, you know, uh, it just has this binomial um, distribution up to a factor. And um, it's, 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 it's fairly easy to look at just the, the, the variation that, ha that, that you have there in terms of k. And so if you apply sort of uh, concentration inequalities, for example, what you find out is that if you want to estimate distances um, with a certain precision tau, I guess I want d hat to be tau close to the real d uh, up, up there, then uh, it turns out that um, the, the amount of data that you need actually depends on how far the species are. So the further apart they are in the tree, the more data you're going to need. The, if the distance between them is m, it sort of grows exponentially with m. It's also going to grow uh, 1 over, so this is like tau square if tau is small, it's going to go like 1 over tau square where tau is the precision again. And then this log factor over here, because I want to be able to do this for um, every pair of species, so there's a, an extra uh, factor that comes from doing a union bound. Okay, so, but in general, the, more, the, the further apart things are in the tree, the more data I'm going to need. Um, and so you immediately get sort of a, a trivial result, which is that I can take m and replace it by the diameter of my tree, um, and that gives me um, uh, an estimate of how much data I need for a, a, a sort of any distance matrix method to work. If, if m is the diameter here, um, imagine that every uh, edge, say, is bounded as a branch length that's bounded between two constants, then this diameter will be uh, of order in general, it could be linear, right? If I have a, one of those um, um, uh, caterpillar-type trees, if I have n, le n leaves and all of these branches here uh, have, have length one, then the diameter could be as large as n. And so, in general, the, the amount of data that I might need uh, might scale exponentially with n. Um, okay, so right, as soon as I have um, enough data to see every pair, and then and and I take the uh, precision to be the, small, the shortest branch length, then I'm going to get um, a correct reconstruction. Now, this is not a, a very nice result, right? If you look right at this way, it's sort of exponential in n, so it grows very fast. And you might think, well, this is not going to be great. It turns out to be actually um, tight for certain types of methods. So one of the most popular methods is, is better known methods is neighbor joining. It's sort of a, a version of this uh, clustering kind of idea that works for uh, uh, the additive case. Um, and, and indeed, uh, for trees of this type, it was shown that indeed you need uh, a really gigantic amount of data in order to, um, to, um, to get the, um, the correct reconstruction, the type of ability. Now, this result is very uh, sort of unsatisfactory because if you look at this particular example, uh, this is an example where, which has a lot of structure in it, and it should be very easy to reconstruct, right? Because what I could do is, um, I could, you know, if I know that this is the structure, I could just sort of around each leaf um, reconstruct just sort of locally what the tree looks like, and then try to uh, 
patch those up together. And now, if I believe my estimate that um, the amount of data I need depends on how far away I go, well, building sort of small neighborhood around each leaf should be something that doesn't require a lot of data, and, and therefore um, I should be able to build this tree very easily um, with, with a very small amount of data. Actually, log n over f squared should be, should be enough if all my branches say have the same uh, length or, or bounded by constants. And so um, um, that sort of led to um, a new class of, of distance matrix uh, methods that um, depends, in, instead of depending on the diameter of the, of the tree, depend on the depth of the tree. So the, the idea here is that you have a tree that has a long diameter, but every edge here is very close to the leaves. It shouldn't be hard to figure out what these, what these edges uh, correspond to with not that much data. And so one way to think about this is, is uh, this uh, distorted metric idea uh, of Mussel and a similar idea by Valerie King and collaborator. Um, is to say, well, if I give you a certain amount of data, k, um, you can imagine there's, there's a, for a fixed precision, there's, there, there's a maximum radius that I can reach where you know, if I look at, at this particular leaf, um, all the leaves that are sort of within that radius, the pairwise distances are going to be well approximated, at least within this tau, and things that are outside of it are going to be all um, um, distorted. Okay, so you get this picture here. Um, and now, uh, using this, this, this idea, well, one, one criterion um, in order to reconstruct the tree correctly would be, well, of course, if, if the ball is of size of the diameter, then every pair is covered and I'm good. But that may not be necessary. So in this case, for example, if I have balls of a small radius, um, and I take the union of all these balls, I'm actually going to cover every edge in the tree, and somehow intuitively that should be enough to reconstruct the entire thing. Um, and so in general, I'm going to define the depth of an edge by, you know, if I take an edge here, I look at the, 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 the shortest path connecting two leaves between them. That's going to be the depth of this edge. And then I uh, take the maximum over this. Um, and the idea now is if I take a diameter for this ball that's of the size, roughly, of the depth of the tree, then when I take the union over all of the leaves, I'm going to cover every edge in the tree. And intuitively, I might be able to actually reconstruct everything there. And so uh, Erdos et al. Um, uh, came up with this first algorithm uh, that actually showed that indeed that's the case, instead of a non very non-trivial result that said that I don't actually need to compute all of the distances. I can actually only use those that are some, somewhat short that corresponds to things that are at distance uh, from the depth from each other. And if you um, um, use them in the right way, there's sort of the combinatorial construction that shows that you can actually uh, recover the entire tree. And so uh, one way to do this is just, again, to build a tree around each leaf in a ball of size roughly the depth, and then take the union, uh, and sort of, uh, you have get this sort of patchwork of thing that you have to put together. Um, and, 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 and it turns out this can be done uh, efficiently. So now you get a new result that says that actually what's, it suffices to have a sequence length that grows like the exponential of the depth instead of the exponential of the diameter. And that can make a big difference because here, for example, the depth is just constant, whereas over there, um, the diameter over here is actually order n. So you get a much better um, convergence rate in this uh, sort of sample complexity of sense. And so in a sense, you're uh, sort of extracting um, information better. Why is the uh, the depth is in general logarithmic? If I if I assume that lambda is um, between uh, two constants f g and my tree, you know, is is binary, um, um, you know, if 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 I bifurcate at every level, I, I'm going to reach a leaf after I, I do this log n times and there. Well, if, if everything is, is bounded between two constants, then it's going to be the same thing, but yes. And so intuitively, the depth is going to be of order log in the worst case, at least under this particular assumption. Um, and so you get this poly independence. Uh, but in general, so this is the formula that's sort of interesting. Right? So there's exponential of the depth versus exponential of the diameter. Um, okay, so lots of work has been done about this. You can push this further and, and actually um, say, Oh, uh, there's, there's been some practical methods that have been developed based on this sort of divide and conquer kind of idea where you build the tree locally and sort of put them uh, together. Um, and, and these, uh, you know, some of these methods are quite, um, quite good. Um, you can push this further by saying, you know, one, one thing that might be a little unsatisfactory with my sample complexity definition is that um, I'm, I'm requiring that I get the correct tree, um, uh, the perfect 
a perfect reconstruction of rolling one minus delta. In general, if I don't have enough data, you know, it might not be possible to actually get the correct tree. And so now you might wonder, well, how far am I going to be from the true tree if I run a sort of an algorithm? Um, one way to sort of formalize this is to say, well, um, I, can, I can modify the previous algorithms for um, reconstructing a partial tree. So I, I reconstruct everything up to a certain depth. Um, uh, using exactly the same kind of idea where I build a thing locally depending on how much data I have and then I put those together. Um, and, and you can show that you, know, you, you actually get a sort of optimal up to some constants in the exponent um, result in terms of how much depth you reconstruct. And if you have edges that are too short, you can also figure out how to contract them along the way. And so um, you can get a sort of partial reconstruction that achieve, in a sense, the, the, the best possible um, uh, sample complexity, at least in, in general. Now, there's a whole story uh, that I'm not going to get into is that you can push this even further. Um, if you, um, um, uh, it turns out that there's a certain regime of parameters where the mutation rate is low enough where um, you can actually completely get rid of this uh, dependence on the depth. Um, and that leads to sort of interesting uh, mathematics, but I won't uh, talk about it. I had some fun cartoons, but... Uh, um, I want, I, so before finishing, I want to go back to this uh, maximum uh, likelihood question, right? So I, I, I've shown you some sort of ad hoc methods. Um, I, the, the algorithms that I described in the previous slides were, were really just, you know, I don't think anybody uses them in practice, they're, they're, or at least nobody has tried to convince biologists to use them much in practice, except maybe for these um, other sort of heuristic that were derived from them. Um, but um, the um, the... The, the, they're really more sort of proofs uh, that certain uh, so certain things can be accomplished. Um, in practice, as I said, biologists tend to use uh, maximum likelihood uh, these days. And, and uh, what I just showed you somehow doesn't really say anything about uh, maximum likelihood. Uh, but a, a recent result we were, uh, with Alan's slide, we were able to show that indeed, um, I didn't tell you what Steele's conjecture is, so forget about that. But the, um, this uh, dependence on the depth, for example, uh, can also be achieved uh, using maximum likelihood. Um, uh, now, we cannot prove that maximum likelihood is sort of better in terms of sample complexity than, 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 than uh, distance matrix methods. We can show that it's better than this certain distance matrix methods uh, in that regime where things are, um, uh, where the depth disappears. But one sort of interesting result that comes out of this is, you know, I said that maximum likelihood was, was NP-hard in general, um, uh, but that's, of course, in the worst case, uh, if I give you an arbitrary data set, the, uh, computing the maximum likelihood a tree on that data set will be NPR. But actually, from this, um, from this result, uh, what you get is that you know, if your data is actually structured, if it's generated by uh, a Markov model on a tree, and you have enough data that uh, these methods actually recover, I mean, if you, you have at least sort of the information theoretic amount of data that you need to recover the, um, the tree exactly, and then um, solving maximum likelihood actually becomes polynomial time because I can use these distance methods, which are fast. Um, they're gu guaranteed to recover the correct tree on these data set with high probability. And uh, what this result shows about maximum likelihood is that with high probability, the, the maximum likelihood is tree is the correct tree. And therefore, I, you know, I can get to it using a distance method. Okay, so maybe uh, some evidence that maybe maximum likelihood, at least on structured data set, is maybe not as hard as the NP-hard results. Um, 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 suggest. Uh, this particular thing is just a, a, a result about about maximum likelihood, just the the, the abstract maximum likelihood problem. If, if I if I can solve exactly the uh, the optimal you know the optimization problem, then the optimal has this property. Um, it's not a, it's not an algorithmic result per se. So I, I can I can get to the truth, you know, algorithmically by implementing, you know, by running these other algorithms. But it, it's not it's not really a way to solve maximum likelihood. It's just a I'm completely out of time. Let me just mention one open problem which is the same, uh, anything about the mixing time of this uh, Bayesian kind of approach. There's some partial results, uh, but uh, very little is known about this. Let me Thank you.
Special Defense, one of the opposing uh, fronts, and so uh, what, what about how is that the theory of construction of biology? Right, so the kind of thing that biologists are very interested in these days is, is you know, I didn't have time to get to it, but um, I told you this sort of very simplistic story when you have one gene from each species and you're reconstructing an evolutionary tree from that. Nowadays, biologists have access to you know, thousands of genes or entire genome, and lots of interesting things happen when you start looking at, at large-scale data. So not, not only from a computational point of view, but even from a, from a modeling point of view, from an inference point of view, you might have, for example, phenomena that are, are creating inconsistencies between different genes. The genes might have different histories, maybe because of, of transfers. You had some slides here. I had a, a slide that... Uh, this, slides is, right this, is one, you know, this is one example where you might have you know, a bacteria transfer or, or virus transferring a piece of DNA between two unrelated species, and now this particular gene now has a history that's completely different from the uh, uh, story. Um, connection between you know, what Steve was talking about and, and, and these, um, I could imagine doing a coalescent now. If I take into account the population uh, level processes in each one of these branches, I could have a tree where on each branch I'm running these, uh, this coalescent process, and it turns out that you have interesting phenomena now where certain genes, if they fail to coalesce in their first common uh, ancestor might lead to trees that have a different topology than the, um, the, um, the actual species history. And now you have to find ways to sort of combine this and, and, and figure out what the, the whole evolutionary history is. And so in particular now, you might wonder, for so example, if you're looking at a case like this, is a, tree, is a tree even what you want to reconstruct? Maybe what you want to reconstruct now is a tree with loops in there that corresponds to these um, uh, lateral gene transfers or, or hybrid speciation events. Um, and that opens up a whole uh, a new area um, and there's this book by Eusen et al., 2010, that describes some of the computational work that was done in this area. So, um, generally speaking, sort of, this is where a lot of the work is being done nowadays, taking into account sort of genomic scale um, phenomena. If there are no further questions, let's thank Sebastian once more.